Hi everyone, welcome to Jedi episode 15. My name is Jimmy and with me today are Ethan, David and our special guest, Yang Zi. For those of you who tune in to our Facebook Live for the first time, and if you want to know more about us and the name Jedi, do check out our first episode in the video section. I'll be the moderator for this episode. So here's how it's going to, going to run through. Uh, firstly, Ethan and David will be having a fireside chat on investments part four. And then Yang Zi will be sharing a bonus section on goal-based investing. Then last but not least, we have a Q&A session. So if you have any questions with regards to investing, uh, feel free to post your questions in the comment section below and we will address them later during the Q&A section. So without further ado, uh, let's start with the fireside chat. Right, Ethan? Hey, okay, hi everyone. I'm uh, Ethan, the founder of Possible. So for today's content, we are going to talk about uh, risk and return. Uh, risk and return matrix, how does it help in the planning and also what's uh, goal-based investing. So this is nothing new, but uh, we hope that this can help you in deciding how you're going to invest. So what is actually the risk and return matrix? So on the previous episode, we talked about risk. So risk is actually the, the incidence and probability of things, bad things happening to you. Yeah, and return is actually the amount of benefit derived within a certain time period. So basically, it's, it's how much you're getting back from your money, yeah, if you fully in very layman terms. Yeah, so it actually helps to draw, if we can look at the relationship between risk and returns. So we do have uh, things that has very high returns, very high risk, very low returns, very high risk. That one you can throw it away, I don't use one. Uh, low returns, low risk, and high returns, low risk. That one is gem. I cannot find. Uh, very difficult to find. Uh, but <laughs> so, so that that is how how it works. Uh. But on a typical one where the risk and return are extremely correlated, uh, so you can actually see the graph shown on the slides. So crypto, forex, and private equity in any company, this actually should give you very high returns but they also bear a lot of risk because crypto can change uh, within 30 to 50% in one day. Uh, some stocks also do that, but let's not go there. <laughs> uh, Forex trading, uh, because you're uh, trading on leverage most of the time, yeah, so even 1% uh, change can be compounded like up to 10 or even 100% loss. Uh. So that is something that uh, you, people will need to take note of. Uh, for stocks, uh, it is less risky than private equity, but doesn't mean that they are not risky also. So if you are looking into something a lot less risk, uh, blue chips will be better. So they are all considered blue chip stocks. Why they are considered blue chip stocks is because they are actually big companies with uh, at least minimum sound financial statement. Uh, uh, SIA is a... Uh, abnormality uh, because now it's really very difficult situation uh. so even the tourism is getting hit but most of blue tips are actually quite stable so even if their price drop it should not drop too much so you can see the risk will be lower the returns will definitely be lower also if you are so concerned about stocks right you can actually buy uh, different basket of stocks so if you diversify the stocks the risk will lower but the returns were also lower because you will not have so many multi-bagger stocks uh, or, or basically stocks that actually uh, make a lot of returns. Uh, if you are looking at even lower risk, you want at least some capital guarantee by the law, maybe I can capital guarantee. Uh. So in the event that uh, a company is bankrupt or have to be fire sale away, then bonds will actually have a higher payment rate than uh, stocks. Basically, it's, uh, the creditors for the bonds will actually take the money first, then the rest will flow to the private uh, investors uh, in this sense. So actually, bonds will have a uh, lower risk, but the returns will be in the form of a coupon. Uh, so they just pay you a coupon. It can be 
uh, monthly, quarterly, semi-annual or even annual. So it depends on how it is structured, but most of the bonds are actually less risky. Then if you want to have even, even lower risk, they are actually uh, targeted funds, low volatile funds, or even endowments, which actually uh, handled by a uh, insurance company, or even uh, fixed income uh, funds handled by financial advisors or fund managers. So these are actually very, very low risk really. So they try to minimize the risk by buying a big, huge basket of bonds or and some stocks that can actually give uh, cash returns. So these are actually very, very low risk, but also slightly lower returns. Uh. And at the end of the cycle, we have cash and fixed deposit. So that one, I don't think you need to say much. Uh. Uh, now, you, just know, you know, for, for stocks, right? Yes. Um, how, how do you have more returns with the same amount of risk? Uh, okay, if you want to have more returns for the same amount of risk, you have to look at stocks that give the same amount of returns but diversify across different geography, different uh, sector, different industry. So at least in the event that one actually uh, may fall, then the returns is minimally impacted uh, by that one stock. So we, we really need to build a very huge basket with the same returns uh, in order to complete this. Uh, actually, the answer I'm looking for is stock split. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> for example, the recent no. Apple one, right? Yeah. The, the most recent one is Tesla. Tesla, oh, yeah. most people are Tesla. Five for one, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so so that is another way. Like, or another way is basically you leverage on the low, volati for the low volatility fund. Yeah. So you can actually push the returns based on the capital that you invested with leverage. Yeah. So by you introduce one small risk into it, which is the interest rate reason. So that can be done also. Yeah, so you can actually have the same amount of returns as stocks but your risk is only increased slightly by the interest rate. So if interest rate increase, you just pay off, uh, then your risk will reduce again. So you don't have much issues, uh, but the debt is provided you can pay off the loan. Uh. So that is also another way. So there are actually a lot of ways to do a lot of things. Uh. It's very complicated. I also don't want to go into that now. So why, why do we even draw this risk return matrix? So it's actually you understand the volatility and the returns associated. So it can give you a overview of what are the possible investment options that you want to undertake for the returns and the risk that you're willing to take. So this actually built upon what we have talked about in uh, investment part two, where we talked that uh, in order to take a certain amount of risk, the reward must outweigh the risk. So that makes sense, man. I mean, if I risk 100% of my capital, that means I, I'm looking to get at least 200% uh, because I must earn back more than what, what I will risk. Man. It doesn't make sense if I earn 1%, but I'm going to lose my capital. I think I put in fixed deposit also better. <laughs> so that kind of, like I say that kind of investment you can throw away already. So how does the matrix help in your planning? So it actually helps you to understand and make a better informed decision. So other people cannot smoke you. Uh. It makes things a lot clearer. So based on the matrix, you will be able to analyze, okay, which, which are the areas that, that may be better to take more risk? Because the returns may be 100%, but you're only risking like maybe 20% because of the future outlook of the company. So it allows you to understand yourself better. And uh, you can also personalize your own risk return matrix if you've done it properly. So for example, if let's say I'm from the healthcare sector, I know healthcare stocks, I know the, the company's uh, fundamentals, right? Then if you invest in healthcare, I think that would be a great decision uh, because you understand healthcare. Right? So you know that if, if any uh, a blue ocean coming in to disrupt the whole sector, right? You're the first one to know uh, since you're in the sector. Yeah, so you can actually assess it much better. You can be more nimble. You can get out of the stocks that you buy 
much faster because you, you can sense it much better than any other people who doesn't do that. So if you look at it in operations wise, uh, it's very relatable. So if you are an electrician, you know how to repair the electrical items, uh, so you won't get electrocuted. But if you are a layman, you don't know, uh, so you don't know where's the risk. Uh. Yeah, so it is a way to personalize it. Uh. So for go based investing, at, at least at the start, uh, this is what we understand. So what we want to do is understand your goal first. Then you look for the investment that can fulfill it. So this actually relates to what we have talked about in investment part one, where we talk about product and concept. So the concept is actually very important. You should not force the product to fit the concept, but you should rather have a concept and find the products that achieve that concept. Yeah. So, okay. So we have a very good advisor, Yang Zi over here. Yeah. Uh, he's from Fast. So uh, let's hear his opinion about what is a goal-based investing. Can. Okay, uh, thanks Ethan and uh, thanks uh, Policy Group for inviting me over for this session. Lah. Um, so I, I guess it, it, goal-based investing is pretty much what you have uh, shared just now. Lah. I, I just shared a little bit more on like a, a bit more in detail and as well as uh, uh, in my experience, right, where invest, why investors actually don't adopt gold-based investing and how, how they can actually start thinking about it. Lah. So a lot of times, right, I have a lot of friends that they, they know uh, that I work at IFAST and then they will come up to me and ask me, hey, just so you are in the investment field, uh, what's good to buy now? Ah? So that's always the question that I get. And my reply always to them is, it depends. I was like, it depends. Then they'll be very frustrated. They'll be like, it depends on what? <laughs> it depends on what, right? <laughs> the real thing is that, right, it depends, what is good to buy depends on what is your goal as well as what is the risk that you are willing to take. So it's different for every uh, investor. So let's just take uh, job hunting, for example. Uh. Let's say today if a friend comes to you and asks you, hey, what do you think is the best job I can take? Uh? So it's very hard to answer this question because it really depends on many things. If, the, if your friend likes creative work, maybe a media company is good. It's the best job. If your friend likes a you know, high pay, don't mind long working hours, and maybe a banking job or a lawyer or an auditor, you know, maybe the best job for a person. Or if your friend today, right, wants to become a multi-millionaire, then perhaps, right, you can suggest that maybe the best job for you uh, is to not have a job, uh, be an entrepreneur, <laughs> not to be a multi-millionaire, uh, right? So if I draw this example back to investing, right, this is just like investing. Uh, every single job that you choose uh, has its different ROI, return on investment. But at the same time, right, every job has its different risk involved also. Like we mentioned that being an entrepreneur, maybe you can make you a multi-millionaire. But the risks are also very big. And not everybody succeeds being an entrepreneur. So if you take a similar concept to investing, right, it is actually the same. So what is the best investment for someone may not be the best investment for you. And and and, and so that's why we look into then the question will be then like that, right? If that's the case, uh, then how how do I uh, start investing, right? How where, If I do it, I got $10,000. I want to start investing. Where do I put my money, right? So in goal-based investing, right, instead of always looking outwards for the answer, you always look outside, look at the economy, you know, look at, you know, Tesla, or I look at Apple, or I look at this, all the exciting things, you know, because a lot of people tend to look outwards. But in goal-based investing, besides looking outwards, uh, we look inward, right, and ask ourselves, uh, what are you investing for? What is my goal investing? Is my goal... Uh, retirement is my goal to achieve uh, 100k in five years. Yeah, so, so you need to start asking yourself what is the what is your specific goal when it comes to uh, investing? It can be a life goal or it can be a portfolio goal. That means you can create a specific portfolio that's supposed to uh, fulfill a certain goal. So when it comes to goal-based investing, right, generally, I mean, you can have a lot of things to discuss about, right? But generally speaking, there are, there are four things that you probably want to consider. Uh, basically, your, your, finance, what is your financial goal, that's the first thing. The second thing is basically your timeline. The third thing is your ability to take risk. And the fourth thing is uh, what resources do you have? Okay, so I'll go a little bit more into detail, uh, these four points. 
So your financial goal, right, is usually uh, tied to what stage of life you are in. Okay. So but I think that generally, right, uh, a mistake, I wouldn't say it's a mistake, lah, something that people probably don't even realize uh, is that a lot of very young people that probably just started just started working, right? They When they sit down with, a, let's say, a financial planner, so they will talk about, you know, you need to plan for your retirement early and stuff like that, right? So a lot of these young people try very hard uh, to imagine how their retirement will look like and how much they will need. So as much as they try, I mean, this is a good way, you know, having a plan is better than having no plan. But personally, right, as a practitioner, I think that this is uh, idealistic, lah, but may not be the most practical way of looking at, at, at things because plans change, expectations change as they grow in their careers, grow in their life. So at that point in time, right, by forcefully trying to imagine how, what is that retirement going to be like and stuff like that, right, which is maybe like 40 years away for someone maybe... 25 years old, just come up from uni, thinking about retirement. I'm still thinking about which is the first job I'm going to take. Now you're asking me about retirement. It's, it's, while it's you know good to start thinking about it, I think that it seldom gives a very accurate uh, picture of what they really want. So when, it thinks, when we talk about your financial goal, right, then in that sense, then how do we think about it, right? So it depends on which life stage you're in. So if you're just beginning your career, I think a realistic financial goal, right, would be to aim for an uh, absolute amount within a, a, a fixed timeline. For example, I say that, you know, today I start a certain job. I want to accumulate 500K in 10 years, for example. Yeah. And then, but if you are in a different life stage, let's say you are uh, going to be in your 50s today, at that point in time, maybe your financial goal would be reasonable to be, you know, aiming for your retirement. Maybe in your 40s, your 50s, uh, as you you kind of like stabilize in your life, you kind of know what you want in your life, then it's pretty reasonable to think about. So for retirement, I want this amount of uh, passive income from my, coming from my investments when I retire. So I think the financial goals, uh, one thing to be very aware of uh, is that uh, we there is a limit to how how far we can how far we can see. Uh. So a lot of times we try to see as far as possible, but it tends to be very idealistic. Realistically speaking, I think the five, 10 years is still visible. Uh, but beyond that, it's really very hard to tell. So uh, so that's the first two points, uh, your financial goal and your timeline. So after there are four points. Uh, so once you understand the financial goal, you understand your timeline. Now what you can do is that you can actually reverse engineer then to find out right how much ROI you actually need. No, no, because now you know I, I need a 500k uh 500k in 10 years or whatever amount you know in X amount of years you can reverse the year to find out this is the amount of ROI I need. So why is this important? Uh? Because you saw in the message earlier that Ethan shared that uh, risk and reward has a certain correlation. So meaning that if you want a higher ROI, then you must be willing have the ability to take a high risk. Okay, so so a bit about the uh, the third point is risk and the fourth thing is actually resources that you have. Lah. So on this point, right, uh, this two thing I probably also got to yeah, it, yeah, also over here. So you see there's a risk and risk and return over here. Okay. So for more returns, you definitely have to take on more risk. Lah. So after you know how much ROI you need to achieve, lah, then you you consider, let's say if I need above um, Let's say if I, if I only need uh, to achieve my goals, I only need uh, 3% per annum, for example. I can achieve my goals already. Then why is it you need to follow your friends and then go and buy stocks and everything? You don't have to. You can just go to policy road and buy and dissipate a, a, a traded endowment because 2 to 3% can fulfill your goal already. But let's just say today, uh, so let's just say today you calculate and you realize you need 10% at least. Then you have to then you probably have to push you know, this, uh, this lever a bit higher and take a little bit of risk to, to achieve that returns. So what I'm saying over here is that I think there is no surefire way and you, a lot of times we, we take reference from what our friends say is good and everything right? without really understanding what is actually suitable, what is actually my like goal. So what works for one person may not work for another person. Lah. So on the point of resources, right, uh, that's on risk. Lah. On the point of resources, what I'm talking about, right, uh, is actually your 
uh, time and money. So resource, uh, time is also a resource because the more resources you have, the bigger risk you can take. So it's not very limited to resources and, and, and uh, risk. If you have a long horizon, you can afford to take a risk because even if you lose the money now, you still have time to make back whatever you lost. So you can take more risk. Uh, similarly, when it comes to money, if you have more cash on hand or you have a very high earning power, you can afford to take more risk because you are you because of your ability to make back whatever you lost. So that is how you can see you know the difference between risk and uh, whatever resources you have. So I think um, what uh what a lot of people because I I met with uh you know investors from different backgrounds and all. So there is a certain mindset that I don't encourage. Uh, that is sometimes when people feel that you know, my earning power is little, is lower. That's why I need to take more risk in investment so that I can catch up with other people. I personally, I don't think that that's a very healthy mindset lah, because that is exactly how people end up burning their fingers. Imagine they reverse engineer, then they calculate, oh, I need a 50% uh, per annum return to catch up with my peer. You know, today I'm earning $500, $1,000. So I need 50% in return because I, I earn 50% of their, so I need 50% return to catch up with them. So, I think that that form of thinking is uh, pretty risky because that will end up, uh, you know, uh, causing people to, to take too much risk. Yeah. So it, it's just an analogy. Uh, it's just like when, uh, it, what, what, what is unrealistic? Uh, just a benchmark, right? Uh, I just did a Google search right before this. Uh, uh, this one, if it's not accurate, I got to blame Google. Uh. So <laughs> Warren Buffett, right? So Shires, right? Since it started trading in 1965, the annual returns is 20.5 percent per annum so if let's just say today you say okay 20.5 percent per annum uh maybe if i follow one buffet whatever he buy i buy maybe i can get 20.5 percent so i guess that is still reasonable if, if you're talking about 30 percent 40 percent 50 percent uh, then you really got to start questioning yourself uh, am i taking too much risk i'm not saying it's impossible there there, there are instances and there are possibilities in the stock market that can be given. It comes with uh, uh, risk also. So when risk is high, right, it means that you are not able to consistently repeat in that this kind of return. So it is not easy. So it, uh, this analogy is like, you know, when uh, someone enters a casino, uh, nobody enters a casino wanting to lose money. Eh? Everybody enters, they want to double, triple their money. But what happens in the end? Everybody, when you leave the casino, right, their pockets become lighter. <laughs> Why? Because too much risk already. They take too much risk already. Yeah. So so that is uh, the relationship between risk and uh, whatever resources you have. Lah. So after you figure out all these uh, four things, uh, your goal, your timeline, your ability to take risk, what resources you have, right? And then you you, you also figure out what how much ROI you need to aim for. So after you figure out all these things, right, that is when you start asking a question. Uh, what is the best investment for me? Only then, then you start looking, what, what should I buy? What should I buy? Because that's when you craft a portfolio that gives you the best chance at achieving this level of ROI. So if you like 8%, let's say I want 8%. So do I buy 8% into one stock? Now, do, I, do I put my money into one stock that can potentially give 8%? Or do I take the same amount of money and then I split into maybe 10 different stocks? Each one has the potential to give me 8%. So suddenly, I, I, my risk is, is lowered, although my chance of getting 8% is pretty similar. So that's the idea of why we want to craft a portfolio, is to give you the best chance at achieving this uh, certain level of uh, return on investment on our island. So that is what uh, go-based investing is about. Yeah. Okay, okay. Th thank you, Yang Zi. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that was very, very informative. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. That's a lot of things. But maybe uh, let, let's talk about something light. Yeah, so maybe introduce yourself to to, to the audience. Uh, we, we, we want to know why, why do you go into this industry actually? So what, what prompts you to want to go in this industry? Okay, this is uh, very interesting. So during my younger days, right, uh, I was actually in the, in the Navy. I was a regular in the Navy. So, you know, in the Navy, basically anything outside in the outside world, I, I have no idea. Right? 
So I started, you know, sometimes sailing in uh, uh, during my sailing days. Uh, there, when you're off port, there's literally nothing for you to do. There's no Wi-Fi. You're in the middle of nowhere, nothing. So I started to pick up the the, the habit of reading. So one of the first few books I read uh, is uh, by Robert Kiyosaki, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, there is a uh, controversy. Uh, some people say it's good. Some people say it's not good. But that was one of the first few books that I started with, which opened up my perspective to the world of like, business and money. So inside the book, right, um, there was actually a, they quoted a, one of Warren Buffett's quotes, uh, which is, if you don't know how to make money while you sleep, you will work until you die. So that, that statement uh, hit me very hard. Like, what well, if you don't know how to make money while you are uh, sleeping, you won't until you die. So that was like an aha moment for me. Uh. Then I suddenly realized that, you know, in the Navy, uh, I never thought about money, you know, because every, the, uh, you know, in the Hokkien saying, right, in Navy is, uh, means that you do or you don't do, right? You just wait for the 10th of the month, you get paid. So, really about money. Money come every ten of month. So I didn't really bother until I read this book. Then I finally realized that ah, I really should spend some time to think about um, how I can multiply my uh, money. Lah. Yeah. So and and that's that's uh, when I actually decided. You know that that started my journey, and eventually that's how I came into this uh, industry. Yeah. Ah. Okay. So so th- thank you so much. Yeah. So it seems seems like the. The book really open up your your mind to, to there's actually a lot more in the finance industry. Yeah. Yes. So maybe while while you are your job, so what what is the most common misconception of you or maybe on your team members? So what what, what do people think of you guys? Or uh, what's the most atrocious uh, comments that you heard? Awesome. I, actually, right. The interesting thing is that uh, I I don't think there is much much a misconception of uh, us now because most people I think in Singapore right don't really know that uh, we exist <laughs> no. <laughs> people are aware of IFAS you know and everything but they're not aware that actually there is a small group of like investment advisors so I guess the traditional idea of a financial advisor right is someone that you know sits with the client goes through a lengthy paperwork to understand the client you know ask the client so much you are how much do you earn? How much insurance coverage do you have? Do you have kids or not? And then they proceed to create a plan and introduce insurance solution. But the thing is that over here, uh, although we are advise, financial advisors as well, but it's very different. We literally skip all the heavy paperwork, right? Because we are because of our fintech capability. Right? You can literally today, like during the circuit breaker period, right? Literally, you can just open an investment account from your end. And then you can just get advice from us without even meeting us in person. Can be over WhatsApp, can be over Zoom, can be, yeah, don't even have to meet. You can invest already and get advice. So I guess that's the, I guess, uh, that's the difference. And, and besides that, I think the advice that we give uh, predominantly before around uh, investments, lah, such as uh, stocks, funds, you know, the ETF, the bonds, portfolio, drink portfolio. So that is where we revolve our services around. Of course, we have insurance products as well, lah, but uh, usually on a request basis, when a client asks, hey, do you, you know, can you look for me? Can you find this thing for me? Then we'll look for them. Lah. But it isn't really the core of our business. Lah. Yeah. So if that's a misconception, then yeah, I don't know if that accounts for a misconception, lah, but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, generally that. Yeah, I think yeah. probably the, the, the misconception is uh they thought you are also like the other person, no? the insurance guy, la, But oh. I think yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, if clients, uh, the clients that were with me for a while, they will they will notice la, that a lot of the topics we talk about will be around what's happening around the world, how it affects the stock market and stuff like that, la. Yeah. So I think that's the that's that's actually very different from from the, the so called normal uh, retail FAs that we, we actually talk about or we, we frequently meet. Uh, I think outside, mm. yeah. So do, do we have any like a memorable client or clients that uh, talk to you maybe about their kids, their dream, mm. or what they want to do like because of your goal based investing? Uh, yeah, maybe so, can share. So that's a. Uh... Most memorable client. Actually, I have quite a number of memorable clients, lah. But I think one specifically that I probably want to mention, right, is a client that we we love to travel a lot. 
Okay, and his dream uh, is to create his own travel blog. So what he does is that sometimes he travel and everything, he will record his own travel videos and everything, but he doesn't really like post and all because he certainly doesn't travel a lot. Secondly, uh, he probably don't have like the professional equipment and everything. Uh. So, so usually what people do is that they save up for their travel, you know, use bonus to travel everything. So for this guy, what he did was that over the many years to me, right, he started investing and then eventually he created, you know, he reached his, attained a certain uh, goal already. So his goal is to create a portfolio that can generate enough income to fund his travels. What I did was I created an income portfolio for him over time. So from that point onwards, right, which was about two years ago, I think, he started traveling literally uh, off his own uh, investment income. Uh. So he didn't, he didn't need to pay out of pocket. So it's very interesting because every time he goes to travel, right, he will, he will film. Uh, of course, sometimes he posts, sometimes he don't. Uh, but because he's just <laughs> thinking about it. But he always thank me in these videos and everything. Uh. So I thought it was especially uh, memorable because it made me realize that you know, investing is not just about the money and the numbers. But I'm actually helping someone improve their uh, quality of life, to helping someone with, like uh, achieve their their dreams. Uh. So I mean, to me, that is the probably the most uh, memorable client that I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So thank thank you, Yanshi, for sharing. Yeah, we really we really love to hear more stories. Uh. But uh, maybe uh, because of time, uh, Jimmy, maybe we can look at what what other things that. Uh, we need to go through. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, thanks, Ethan and David and Yangzi, uh, for the fireside chat and other uh, section. Uh, so we hope you find it valuable for your own investments. So we we'll now go for the Q and A section. So uh, post your questions in the comment section below as we are now addressing them. Uh, so, uh, is there any question from your WhatsApp? Uh, cu currently, no. No. Uh, okay, so currently from the main page, yeah, no questions so far. Um, any questions from among ourselves, maybe? Uh, yeah, I have a question. So for, for Yang Zi, right? Um, mm. What's your average uh, average client like? Average client? Uh, okay. So I am uh, currently managing about 25 million SGP, uh, roughly, okay? So the interesting thing is that about uh, 15 million belongs to probably five people. And I have 10 million that belongs to about... 100 over clients. So I think the spectrum is pretty wide. Lah. So from, from the very young investors that just started uh, investing, uh, like just started working, to even um, CEOs of uh, companies. So I, I don't think that's like a typical client that I have. Lah. The only common trait they have is that they, they want to make money. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I don't think it's a, like a typical kind of uh, investor. Lah. It, it's quite a wide spectrum. Quite a wide spectrum. Yeah. Does that answer your, your question? I'm sorry, I didn't really fully under, uh, answer that question. Lah, but it's really quite a wide spectrum. Mm. Yeah, so it's about okay. 100k, is it? The uh, entry level client. Um, actually, no. Eh. Um, there are some advisors that uh, they set a certain amount, you know, like, you know, you need to invest a 100k, they can invest in me. But for myself, I don't because um, typically, I mean, to be fair to some advisors, right, they run it as a business. So from an ROI perspective, maybe they feel it's not worth their time. But for me, right, as an investor, you need to have, you need to, uh, I'm a long-term investor. So I take this principle and I apply, apply it to every aspect of my life. And that includes my clients. Today, you may have $1,000, but you know I believe in the future potential of uh, 
uh, of a client la. so let's say today you only have a thousand dollars it does not mean that 10 years later you will still have a thousand dollars maybe over the course of this five ten years you, you know suddenly woke up and then boom you know made a lot of money who knows so yeah there is no i i i don't really like determine a minimum amount la. probably the minimum amount is limited by the lot size <laughs> Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so, uh, maybe one last thing. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can tell us uh, who, who are the people that you may wish to meet and uh, how, how do you want to like, uh, set up uh, maybe a business relationship? Yeah. Who are the people I want to meet? Uh? Hmm, that's a good question. I, I think that basically of course if i uh if there's any business that i can uh add value to la. basically like you know it could be corporate it could be people whereby they have like you know I, clients that you know want to access market like for example let's just say today uh it could be financial advisors that you know are limited with what they have and then they have specific clients that want to look into let's say us equities you know or hong kong equities you know stuff like that this will be the people i love to work with or it could be even companies that have you know they are looking for things like you know pension plan they're thinking about you know how do i create pension plans for my company how do i manage my company resources and stuff like that but this would be uh yeah basically any anybody who is uh, looking to achieve you know more efficiency in with the either, either cash uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, so so thank you so much, Yang Tzu. Yeah, yeah uh, Jimmy, I think uh, due to lack of time, yeah, maybe you can continue already. Okay, can. So with the interest of time, I think we're going to end this episode. Yeah. So for those of you who have tuned in, uh, thanks for tuning in to our Jedi episode 15. Uh, if you still have questions with regards to investing, uh, you can still post your questions in the comment section as uh, this video will remain in our Facebook account, right? And any questions, we will address them during the next episode. Yeah. So as you can see on the current slide, uh, there's this QR code whereby you scan this QR code, uh, it will direct you to our landing page whereby you have access to our website, Facebook, YouTube, and Telegram channel. Okay, as for the Telegram channel, you will be able to see details of the list of uh, resale endowment policies that we have. So if you are interested or you want to know more about the resale endowment policies that we have, uh, do reach out, reach out on Telegram and we will, uh, we'll, we'll get back to you. So speaking of the next episode, uh, join us next Friday, 5 p.m. for Jedi episode 16 on Investments Part 5. Uh, if you like our content and be notified for future episodes, do, do like our page on Facebook and share this post. Uh, we will see you next Friday and May, May the financial success be, be with you. Okay, goodbye. Okay, thanks. Yeah.